Guwati, Kesh A. Yat A. Greetings, everyone. I am John Jahadi. I am the cultural educator here at the Indian Public Cultural Center. And I want to welcome everybody who is joining us today to the Indian Public Cultural Center. Uh, it's just, just a really fun time to really talk about food and books. And I'm really glad everyone's here who could join us. I'm going to turn my camera around real briefly to show you our audience here. So if you wouldn't mind, clap your hands to those who have joined us. Yay! Thank you, everybody, for joining us today here at the Indian Public Culture Center in the Chaco One Room. Uh, I'm glad everyone's here to join us as well. Um, as I said, I am um, from the Pueblos of Laguna and Zuni. I am the culture educator. But I guess above all those things, before I was any of those things, I was a foodie. So as a foodie, obviously, uh, we as human beings re require um, essential things. Food and water is the top. As, if, if we have food and water, then we as human beings can survive in the environments that we choose to live in. And many cultures around the, on this planet of ours utilize the things they have in their environment. Oftentimes, human beings will acquire the resources and tools in their environment. Oftentimes they'll say their tools or resources, they find ways to sustain their communities. However, one thing that we oftentimes don't always think about as it applies to a resource or a tool, certainly we think about plants that people pick or the animals that they kill, the rocks in the woods and all the things that they find in their environment. However, we fail to oftentimes consider one important tool. And that very important tool is that space between our ears. We call it the human brain. Because it's through the human brain we get to problem solve, process improvement, systems management. Certainly we have those terms today, but when we think about all the civilizations that have existed, not solely just on this side of the world, but certainly on this planet of ours, we have always found ways to find whatever it is that will sustain and provide us nutrition. It's through systems management and process improvement that there were only certain things that were only on this side of the world that were not on the other side of the world and vice versa. Some of the things that were only on this side of the world and none of those things just grew in the wild. They required us as human beings to do something. They just no longer just pop up anywhere. Those words that we use nowadays, they're science-based, agriculture, biology. All of those things are essential to why we get a chance to be here as human beings. And because of those problem-solving skills, human beings were able to produce crops like corn, beans, squash, potatoes, tomatoes, cocoa, tobacco, plantains, chili, avocados, quinoa, amaranth, pumpkins, peanuts. None of those things simply grew in the wild. They required us as human beings to cultivate them, to irrigate them, to fertilize them. Additionally, it requires science. Simply, basically put biology, photosynthesis, cellular division, mitosis, pollination, all of those things are essential to how societies, how human beings have always lived and then therefore benefit from all the effort and the sciences that are involved. So really food, cuisine, recipe is science, chemistry, I guess you say. When we think about baking things, when we talk about adding spices to it, it's the blend of all those things that make the food what it is today, but it's also the blend of all the diversity and the culture that brings us to experience the kind of tastes that we certainly all enjoy. That's what I get from this book. The diversity of the cultures that existed here, the efforts of the human beings that created the kinds of foods we certainly enjoy today. And it's just kind of really fun to talk about food because like I said, I'm a foodie and I really, I enjoy eating. I enjoy the food I eat. And if I was probably not Native American, I certainly would have liked to have been born either Italian because I love pasta. But then again, I certainly love Asian food. Food is everywhere. So it's just fantastic that we get a chance to do that. So yes, we have to cook it. So I get a chance to really read these fantastic books. But then again, at the same time, it's really an honor to have 
you introduce, have me introduce our guest to you today. But before the, we do that, let me go through some of the things that I've gone through for each of our, um, our, um, our um, uh, book clubs here that we have for our book club here. So I want to um, quickly mention, we're, we're gonna be talking about our Pueblo Book Club for May, 2022. Uh, we are recording this and hopefully sometime in the future, we'll let you know when our book club will be available to, uh, for everyone to view. I'm just gonna briefly break it. If you wouldn't mind, could you shut the door for us, please? Sure. Thank you. We're here in, our, here in one of the uh, classroom or the um, meeting rooms here at the Cultural Center. So um, I just wanna make sure the door shut, we don't get disturbed anyway. So um, one of the things we wanna help our guests understand, then you are all my guests today, is that we wanna make sure that you participate. That's why we have the book club. Questions, comments, something that you experience, especially as it applies to this particular book, uh, maybe if it's about the photography or if it's something you've read that really connected with you, I certainly invite you to uh, perhaps join in our conversation with our very special guests today. We also want to be respectful, certainly considerate of others in our, uh, in our uh, audience here, both those who are joining us on um, here in person, as well as those of us who, those of you who are joining us on the um, web at Zoom. So I'm glad you're here to join us as well. Comments and questions are certainly invited. We ask if you're joining us on Zoom, stay muted. Um, our moderator will uh, advise you when we want to bring you on, so then we'll let you um, be um, unmuted on, on your computer. And if you're joining us over the internet um, and on Zoom, please introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from. Last year, we had some fantastic um, people join us. One joined us, joined us. One joined us from Washington, D.C., and another person joined us all the way from Thailand. So that was fantastic, and I was really glad that that person was able to do that. So, so let's proceed with what we're going to do today. This is the book that we're going to be talking about, uh, and let me tell you why I chose this particular book at this particular time. Certainly, with COVID, we have not had all we have not all had the opportunity to go to our pueblos to enjoy the feast days. But this is the time when we're actually really getting involved into feast days. And what better way to celebrate feast days is with food. When you, I'm sure perhaps many of you have had the opportunity to go to many of our pueblos, it's not uncommon for someone to say, come in, sit down in our house. Here's some food. This is the bounty of which our creator has provided us and we're sharing it with you. That's what the feast day is centered. And then certainly the dances are there and the vendors are there. But really what it's centered on is the fact that giving back to the community, giving back to those who are there to appreciate it. And that's the core value of our feast days. Even before the Europeans came to this side or to this region area, they were having celebrations to commemorate bountiful harvests, times when things were good, but then again, the times to remember the times that were not always so good. That's what feast days are centered on, having those ideas. So. This is what we're gonna be talking about. Um, I wanna invite you to look at your books if you have them, if you don't, no worries, we'll be glad to do that. I have been thinking over the past month as since the last book, thinking about talking points. And I tr often try to think of talking points of ways that we can develop a dialogue of those who are visiting us here in the cultural center as well as those who are joining us via Zoom. So I brought up these uh, talking points as a way to perhaps get us something, a dialogue going, a way that we can begin to communicate and develop questions for all of us. Uh, certainly culture, as I mentioned, food and science, what is their connection? How are they connected to all of one another? How is it that we benefit from those who uh, find ways to prepare the kinds of foods that we have? Sometimes when we think about different foods, especially when we're different cultures, it's sometimes a little dubious to think about, well, it, how is that going to taste? Is it going to feel kind of squishy in my mouth or is it going to be too hot? We always are very concerned about how foods are going to be. And it always reminds me, perhaps this will sort of cause you all to, to date me. Remember that commercial back uh, in the 70s about the life cereal, about let Mikey eat it? Okay, remember that? You know, how does somebody know that artichokes were good to eat? Or how does someone know that octopus was a good thing to eat or uh, you know whatever you can think of whatever food or asparagus or I love Brussels sprouts but some people hate Brussels sprouts 
How did somebody know that? That's worth eating. It's not going to make me sick, let alone kill me. Who? They had somebody had to find out. Said, "Hey, let Mike eat it. If he's still around after a couple of days, I guess it's so good to eat." <laughs> so that's what really, when I think about food like that, like if you go abroad, sometimes you see kinds of food that you never thought you'd think about eating. Maybe some people around the world, bless you, some people around the world, they eat insects. Okay. <laughs> Would you eat an insect? I don't know. If you were hungry enough, maybe you might. But again, that's what food is all about. That's what nourishment is all about. Today, we certainly are bombarded with all kinds of food. And then we're certainly bombarded with all kinds of information. What's good, what not, what's not good. Red wine's good one time. Oh, red wine's not good for you next time. Um, too much salt is okay. Oh, too much salt is bad for you. So there's always gonna be these bits of information that we have to value. But the, at the same time, we know how good food tastes. And that's really the way that we can appreciate being human beings, that we can appreciate the kinds of foods we eat. So those are the kinds of things I want you to think about food, science, and culture. Next one, I've heard it say many, many times, we eat with our eyes. The presentation of the food, it automatically starts you drooling inside your mouth because it looks so good. Some of us even take pictures of it, right? And you send it to your family and friends, say, oh, I'm here at this restaurant. This food looks fantastic. So again, we eat with our eyes because really that's our first impression of the food next to this aroma and the fantastic smells that we get whenever we're, we're around food. So that's why I put that up there. Can food be nutritious at the same time? Tastes fantastic. Sometimes food isn't always the best in things about being nutritious for you, benefiting us as, as human beings, but it sure does taste good. You know, is everybody eat buttered popcorn all day long? Sure tastes great, but is it good for you? I don't know. Some people will say yes, some people will say no. So is food nutritious and can it be taste, can it also taste fantastic as well? And those of you out there in our audience, both in here in public as well as on Zoom, maybe you have a conundrum. Maybe you've always tried to do this and it just hasn't turned out right. You follow the recipe right step by step. It just didn't turn out the way you, it looked on the piece of the book where you had. I know I've been there. I'm just not a good baker. I, I've tried so many times. I love to cook. I love to, because I love to eat, but I'm just not a good baker. And I try different things. My tortillas suck. They just don't, they're not as good. They're not as good as my grandmother's or, you know, sometimes this doesn't just look exactly right, but I certainly love to eat. So maybe there, you have a conundrum. Maybe you have a, a question you'd like to ask of our guest that will help you kind of make your, your recipe kind of just kick. That's right there. It'll be help you out. So hope you have those questions. And lastly, um, uh, Lois Ellen Frank uh, is at the Red Mesa Cuisine. Well, what is the Red Mesa Cuisine? I, anybody here has, has ever, have they known of it before? Well, no hands up here. Let me switch around here. Okay, I, I can't see. We might switch around here. But anyway, how many of us know what the Red Mesa Cuisine is? We're going to have uh, um, Lois tell us all about that. So let's get on with what we're doing today. And I'm going to bring up my screen here. And I'm going to, let's bring Lois on, um, on our screen here. Lois, thank you for joining us today. It's really such a pleasure. I'm really jazzed. Like I said, I'm a foodie. I really um, look, have looked forward to having you join us today. So I'm going to bring you up there. There you are. And so well, thank you for joining us today, Lois. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to be here. And um, a big welcome to everybody, both in person and on Zoom. Well, glad I'm glad you're here. Um, I was impressed with uh, the the book that you uh, created. Uh, I was reading it, um, and to begin with, as, as I mentioned to you, I was really intrigued in the preface and in the uh, forward of the book. I was uh, certainly the the pictures are fantastic. I think that's what you said in uh, the beginning of your book that you uh, were for, foremost first a photographer, uh, and it obviously shows that. But I really connected more with the preface and the information you shared, not just about yourself, but really the concept of how you saw food, what then moved you to then go into cultural anthropology to tie these things together. So can you elaborate a little bit about that and how it's helped you? 
Okay, um, first I'm gonna just um, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Lois Ellen Frank and uh, I am uh, Kiowa and Northern European on my mom's side and Sephardic and Ashkenazi on my dad's side. So I grew up uh, multilingual, multicultural, sort of multi everything. And um, I'm classically trained as a chef. So I did go to culinary school and I was told in culinary school that as a woman, I would never be a chef. And that didn't sit well with me. They wanted me to go into pastry. And um, I really don't uh, like sugar. So um, uh, there's diabetes in my family. So um, I went to photography school and what came naturally to me was to become a food photographer. And um, I uh, worked in the advertising industry in Los Angeles. I, my undergraduate degree is from Brooks, which is in Santa Barbara. And um, then uh, I uh, moved to Santa Fe after the LA riots in uh, early 90s and started doing Private Chef and then formed Red Mesa, I actually went to New York to propose doing a book on Native American cuisine. And the publishers in New York told me that uh, Native people didn't have a cuisine, which I found very offensive. Um, Where'd they get that idea? Uh, well, they thought only the Italians and the French and the other European groups. So I, they also said to me that, um, I had no credentials with a BA in art. So I re-entered academia and got my master's and my PhD. And my PhD is entitled The Discourse and Practice of Native American Cuisine, Native American Chefs and Native American Cooks in Contemporary Southwest Kitchens. And it took me about 11 years to do that, but now I am an authority. I have an authoritative voice on that. And I work uh, with doctors, nurse practitioners. Um, I have a wonderful base of clients. I work with the US government as a culinary diplomat. I work with the New Mexico Department of Health, um, teaching cooks in our senior centers, tribal senior centers, uh, <coughs> as well as um, uh, healthy Kids, Healthy Communities, and SNAP Ed, and FDPIR. That's our give back. And then I have clients from all over the world. And we work, uh, I work with Chef Walter Whitewater, who's Navajo. So it's pretty much just me and Walter and then freelance staff in Red Mesa. And we go all over uh, the United States and uh, do events. Well, that's, you're a busy person, aren't you? Yeah. Well, tell again, I was reading in the forward in the preface of the book about um, your realization about how science was integral to cooking and to cuisine. And that's what really intrigued me because first of all, I'm a science teacher and I see science in everything. And oftentimes we certainly appreciate good food, exceptional food, but we don't really think about, oh, the chemistry and, and the the art of it. Um, what helped you put that in a form that now we have this book that you have? So there's two kinds of science. Uh, there's an indigenous science, which we call uh, TEK, or traditional ecological knowledge. And every culture in the world has their own form of this indigenous knowledge. But this indigenous knowledge was never validated as having um, importance or being uh, crucial to the perpetuation of our indigenous knowledge. And so uh, the way native people pass on this science is through um, generations, right? So songs, stories, beliefs, recipes, agricultural practices, ways of being in the world. And then there's another form of science, which is a Western form of science. And that is uh, if you use baking powder with cornmeal, then the cornmeal will rise and fluff because the baking powder is an emulsifier 
and reacts with the cornmeal, very much like uh, our ash or our culinary ash, which we always used in the past. Uh, and culinary ash is an interesting science example because one gram, which is about the equivalent of a paper clip, has the same amount of calcium as an eight ounce glass of milk. So as native people, we never needed dairy. We never had dairy. Dairy's not in our ancestral DNA. So when the US government came in and said, you guys need milk powder, the truth of it is no, most of us don't need milk powder. Most of us are lactose intolerant. We have this ash, which has tons of calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, manganese, zinc, iron, and copper. And that's fulfilling all of these needs. So another really good form of science would be what we would call nixtalamization. Nixtalamization is ash corn. So you soak the corn in ash, you cook it in the ash, the skins come off. The corn can then either be ground into a masa and dried, or it can be ground into a fresh masa. That masa is what's used for corn tortillas and tamales. And thousands of years ago, our ancestors came up with this science, this method of treating corn to make it healthier, to add nutrients, all through the use of ash. Here in New Mexico, we now call this corn that's been treated pasole. In other parts of the country, they call it hominy, and that's the whole corn. But whenever you buy a bag of corn flour or masa arena to make a tortilla or a tamale, that's treated corn. This is indigenous science. These are all forms of indigenous science. And so I've really worked hard with other academics to give validity to these indigenous ways of cooking and being in the world, as opposed to just using Western science, like a, an experiment of, you know, you mix this and this and this happens. Um, these forms of knowledge are very vital in our native communities. And they're also a form of food sovereignty. Uh, you know, and what is food sovereignty? It's one of those non-native words, but it basically means the right to sufficient, healthy, culturally appropriate food. And so, you know, um, what we have to realize is that uh, someone who had a grandma who made apple pie and that's your comfort food is not the same for everyone. Not everyone's grandma made apple pie. That's not everyone's comfort food. If I'm <clears throat> Thai American, that's probably not my comfort food. If I'm Italian American, that's probably not my comfort food. If I'm Native American, that's probably not my comfort food. Maybe it's a corn dish or maybe it's something else. And so we have to realize that the diversity and the way of being in the world, all these sciences are different. I always do the analogy of a bicycle wheel. So you have something in the center and then all these different spokes and that's all the different cultural groups going to the same recipe or the same place, uh, but from a different perspective on the outer wheel. And it's okay. It's, it, we don't all have to be homogenized. We don't all have to be the same. And it creates an appreciation for diversity, but an understanding of how people are in the world and how people are in the world is different for every culture group. Exactly. Let's pick up on that concept. I, I, I like that concept you mentioned about uh, food sovereignty. First of all, it's the right to have the choices of food, which not just you as a person uh, feel gives you, provides you comfort, but as a culture, as a, as a society or as a community, that's their right. And I liked how you explained that. Can you elaborate on that? So, you know, we can look at... Um, Native American food sovereignty, and we can say it's a form of food justice. Uh, it's food security, having enough, not feeling like you're, you don't know where your next meal is coming from. Uh, environmental justice, you have to have a pristine environment to grow food or to harvest wild rice on a lake. It can't be polluted. Uh, we have to have hunting grounds for our animals. We have to have places uh, for food and plants and animals to grow. So we need an environment that can do that. It can't be a toxic environment. It can't be a too small an environment. And then it's all dependent on this idea of knowledge. You said, you know, how did people know how to do this? How did people know how to eat this or how to eat that? And um, it's trial and error. And then accumulative over thousands of years, 
even though it's passed down orally in native tradition, doesn't make it any less than writing it down. Though they both have validity. Um, and so it's dependent on TEK or traditional ecological knowledge. And it's also the idea that communities can produce, grow, and harvest their own food, but also that there are sources where they can buy food from other native vendors or other native entrepreneurs or other native farmers or other native uh, families, you know, because as native people, we always had these trade routes. So if I was a Pueblo person that grew chili, I could trade with a plains person for bison, dried bison, jerky, right? I'm Kiowa, so I can go up to Taos and Peekeries and I can hear that they have our songs. They have uh, different ways in their ceremonies, a piece of us, the same way we have a piece of Pueblo people in our way of being. And so we definitely traded, we definitely had exchanges and these exchanges were vital uh, for the diversification of a diet. Um, I know you named, I call it the magic eight. Uh, so eight foods that native people gave to the world. So before 1492, they didn't exist anywhere outside of the Americas. Corn, beans, squash, three sisters, holy trinity, corn, bean, squash, chili, tomato, potato, vanilla, and cacao. And in 2009, scientists at the University of New Mexico found a vessel in Chaco Canyon. In the vessel was theobromine. They radiocarbon dated theobromine to find that it's the marker for chocolate and that it existed in Chaco Canyon up over 1250 years ago. So how did it get here that far back? People walked it here and they trade it. So our trade routes, very vital, very extensive, much further than scientists, Western scientists originally thought. And so as we look at all of these factors, what it does is it reconnects us to our land, to our community and to our culture. And, you know, I do wanna quantify that, you know, everybody, everybody is indigenous to somewhere. Everybody has an indigenous root. I think what we have to encourage people to do is try and figure out what is your own lineage and what is your own indigeneity and then reconnect with that and reconnect with those foods. Um, there's a, a, a medicine man that we work with uh, from Hemez, and I love his approach because what he says is that we're all earth people. We can't undo that, which means that we all have to be stewards of, uh, of this planet, of this place, and work together. Because if only one group is doing something, the other groups are polluting, it's not going to work. So we have to collectively work uh, together. You brought up some fantastic topics, and um, I, I, I'd like to get, touch on all of them, but I do want to check, uh, connect with what you mentioned about trade, because it, oftentimes we, myself, as well as other academics and yourself, I heard you mention corn, corn being a paramount food substance that did not originate here, in what we now call the Southwest. It's in the book, you begin to identify that. Uh, and that really is a is the best example of commerce, the best example of people saying, you know, hey, how'd you get that over there? What do you, what do you want for that? Or do you want a bison hide or some meat for that? And I'll, can you, can, I'll, I'll trade for you. That was always the way many indigenous peoples who are here, they developed that. So could you elaborate on, uh, I think in the book you mentioned about how corn was developed 7,000 years ago in what we now call uh, the Central America, but now it's really here. And it's really what sustained the pilgrims when they came and subsequently the Jamestown and other communities. But without that commodity of corn, human beings would not be on the side of the world. So um, corn, you know, in native ideology, corn is way more than just food. Um, and I think a lot of people, I think the original first Europeans didn't know that. So when we look at the layers of meaning and corn is the indigenous grain to the Americas, very much like wheat is the indigenous grain to Europe and rice, the indigenous grain to Asia. And you can look at the cuisines and say, the cuisines revolve around those dominant grains. So, you know, for a native person, corn 
is a gift from creator. Corn is storyteller, corn is ceremony, corn is song, corn is prayer, corn is maiden, corn is mother, corn is sister, corn is healer, corn is medicine, corn is sustenance, corn is food, corn is art, corn for me at least is the essence of life. And so there's many, many, many layers of, of, of meaning. And I don't think Europeans realized that the gold that they were in search of was really the corn. The gold was the yellow corn kernels and how vital it is and how important it is to uh, this continent. And so even though it originated in the South, it came North and it went South and now corn is vital uh, in pretty much uh, from as far as it grows in the North to as far as it grows in the South uh, to the indigenous communities that are stewards for that sacred food. Exactly. You know, I did a, a little research um, just on the subject of corn, and I see you have the same uh, poster behind you that I have behind me. Uh, again, it just tells you the variety, the diversity of just this thing we call corn. But corn right now, as I understand, and looking up some research, uh, it's the number one commodity exported by both the United States and China, that we don't just grow corn for food consumption. We grow corn and we actually synthesize chemicals from it. We put it in gasoline. And if you go to a grocery store, pick up any object that you, or uh, item that you want to purchase, you look around and look at the contents, somewhere you're gonna see corn. That's how essential and paramount corn has become to us as human beings, even in the year 2022. So I, we're making these historic connections of what our ancestral uh, um, uh, relatives did and then now putting it into a context, how we continue to rely on it today. The other thing I wanted to mention or kind of bring up to talk to you without, you just mentioned it a little bit ago, is about how science, certainly Western science, it's, it's we, we learned that in school, we all, all, all students learn about chemistry and physics and so forth, but chem, science never remain, nevertheless remains the same. Uh, if it's indigenous knowledge versus what we call Western knowledge, the principles are the same. Uh, pollination, the cellular division, a photosynthesis, they're essential to uh, what we understand in our environment. And you mentioned this just a bit ago about how there was had to be some adjustments in how science saw the impact of human beings. Here in New Mexico, within the past month, we noticed or if you've ever, um, if you've done any kind or listened to some of the news, they've had to realize it says, you know what? We were not quite correct in how long human beings have been here. We need to push that another back 20,000 more years. Previously, they thought that, oh, humans have been only on this side of the world for maybe 5,000 years, maybe, because we don't really see any evidence of that. But if we, if you Google search or um, white sands footprints, you'll find that something happened recently that shows how long human beings have been here. Did you know about that, um, Lois, about the footprints? Yeah, the footprints in the um, in white sands. So yeah, uh, you know, and if we look at native science or oral tradition, we can say that many native communities have said, well, corn is at least 10,000 years old and pottery goes further back than that. And we were definitely cooking and processing and doing things. And now Western science has sort of caught up and said, oh yeah, oh yeah, and it's it just a little goes, bit older than we thought. And it just goes, like you just says, it validates it. We can, we can use certainly Western science to credit and, and validate historic knowledge, indigenous knowledge as it applies to uh, the kinds of foods we eat. So let's talk about food, okay? That's what we're here to do is talk about food. Tell us a little bit about, um, how you were able to transition the, all this information about the images you had created, the pictures, and then put it into a way that you could look at the images on this book and just really appreciate it. Not even in tasting it, but just looking at it. It helps us get those juices flowing. So all the uh, images in the cookbook are real. It's real food. It's not fake or with glue or whatever they do in the advertising world. Uh, and we really made the recipes. We tested uh, them, you know, multiple times, and uh, really worked with some wonderful elders and native cooks. And um, you know, the book is really a celebration about 
uh, about that. It's, I'm just a facilitator. These are not my recipes. They belong to the ancestors. And that's what you wrote in the book. You said these, um, the knowledge, the recipes, some of the foods and the items in which you uh, uh, mentioned in the book, you got from those who contributed and helped you with this book, correct? Yeah. And it's just a little bit, we're gonna to go to um, some of, if anyone makes it wants, wants to make a comment or would like to ask uh, Lois a question. And we also have some um, guests who are joining us on, um, on Zoom. If you want to ask a question in, in your chat box at the bottom, write in your question and we'll, if you can, uh, tell us your name and tell us where you're at. We certainly would love to uh, know that a little bit about you so that we can um, um, pass that information along to everybody. I just want to mention um, on my other screen here, I have Facebook open to the Indian Public Cultural Center book club page. We have right now 100 likes from different people. Let me see if I can find, bring some up and just kind of mention some names. We have Anna, Adam, Jorge, um, Bersica. It looks like a, either a, a Scandinavian, Scandinavian name. Let me see if I can find some. We have uh, We Kiss, Yellow, Thun, Yellow Bird. Let me just try that here, where, where, where that person is from. Uh, does it tell me? Sometimes, oh, here we go. They are from Wyoming. Oh, wow, thank you for joining us. Um, we have other people joining us from other places. I have a lady whose name is Pam. She's joining us from Ohio um, on Facebook. Thank you very much, Pam. Appreciate you joining us. And again, for the people who are joining us, on um, Zoom, you can always follow us on Facebook as well. So um, um, I was ask Monique, do we have anybody who would like to make a comment? Uh, we can get them ready, but what I wanna do right now is I want to um, bring up a, 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 a slide that I have prepared. And I would like to um, ask um, Lois to comment on it. Uh, this is one of the things I found in, um, here, this one. This is in the forward of the book. Oops, there we go. This is in the forward of the book. Uh, it's, uh, if you can, can you see that on your screen there, uh, Lois? Where'd she go? Let me go back again here. Are you there, Lois? Yeah, I can't, okay. I don't see anything. Okay, so, okay, let me read it for you then. Let me read it. Uh, this is in the forward. It says, academia has given me a new perspective on how to represent other people's and their foods. It has given me the opportunity to take full responsibility for their representations and to collaborate with people's, people from each community. And I've underlined and I've highlighted the terms responsibility and collaborate. And I find that very intriguing and very uh, empathetic to have a professional acknowledge the, their responsibility to a culture, uh, to a uh, societal structure that you presumed that connection that you wanted to then share with others. Can you tell us a little bit about that transition for you? So, um, you know, I think it's really easy to try and represent someone else, but uh, you can't really rep someone, represent someone else. You have to collaborate with them. You have to get them to talk about how their way of being in the world is you're the facilitator, like I said before. So I can't speak for you. I, I think you said Zuni and Laguna because I'm not from there, but I could collaborate with you and I could ask you questions and I could quote you and I could say that John's uh, way of being in the world is this, or this is what he does in Zuni or in Laguna. Um, but I can't assume, so I have to take responsibility for my role in this, but I need other people to voice who they are and what their way of being in the world is because I can't represent them without that collaboration. And I think that uh, academia, you know, the days of the, the great um, non-native anthropologists that would go into a community and after a month or six months, be an expert. And the truth of it is, it takes most of us our entire life 
to understand our cultures and to understand our medicine ways and to understand how to harvest plants and to understand uh, how to pass things on. And, um, you know, food is something that people are willing to share, but I was very careful uh, because, you know, some of the religious practices people don't want to share. And I have to respect that and honor that uh, because that's private and that's completely okay. There, it, it's, I'm just a chef working with food uh, and community members to get the food out there so that it perpetuates. And, you know, I'm a big proponent of re-indigenizing, revitalizing, re, uh, um, uh, remaking our food so that it can be perpetuated for generations to come. You know, we have some historical trauma and that historical trauma was you can't speak your language. You can't do your religion. You can't do your ceremonies. You can't practice your food. We're going to feed you meatloaf and mashed potatoes with gravy. And that is the boarding school era. And those are not our indigenous foods. And so there was this whole generation of people in this historical trauma and we're, we're coming out of it. You know, I, I think it's really important to understand the past, but I think it's also really important not to dwell in the past. I mean, I'm half Jewish and the Jews were exterminated too. So, you know, we have to understand history and then focus on how do we um, move forward and heal and revitalize and reinvigorate and reindigenize these foods for health and wellness in our native communities. And COVID really taught us that because Native Americans were the hardest hit. Uh, and, you know, a big part of my mission now uh, is, is to do that, is to work with cooks and community members on uh, whatever they have available to them, whether it's fresh or not fresh, it's a, a, a can of beans, dried chili, whatever it is. Uh, to make healthy, simple foods uh, for health and wellness in our native communities. I like that word you use, indigenize. So that's really uh, interesting word. And actually, one of our listeners, uh, Molly, picked up on that. So, can we bring Molly on? Um, Monique, uh, let's have her. Um, she wrote a comment here in the chat um, that I'd like for her to share with um, Lois. Are you on, Molly? Can you hear me? Yes, can you? Fine, terrific. Thank you, Molly, for joining us today. Sure. I'm not sure how long, because as usual, I have a napping granddaughter here, but we'll see. Um, do you want me just to read my question? Well, whatever. Sure. Go ahead, Molly. Um, I appreciate that Lois has sort of challenged some of the words we throw around, like food sovereignty, as not an indigenous term or concept. And as she was just talking, I was thinking about well, what about the term expert or professional? Do you have to have a PhD for people to believe that you know what you're talking about regarding food? And whose terms are those? And how do we push those on other groups of people who may have a different perspective uh, considering those terms? Does, does that make sense? Did you get that, Lois? Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to use the word professional or expert, but I am going to use the word organic. And what's really fascinating is in most, not all, but most indigenous languages, there's not a differentiation between organic and non-organic because it was never a native concept to use petrochemicals to spray our food. Uh, we planted in families. We planted corn, beans, and squash together because they like to grow together. They're a family. We planted using compost, using fish bones or seashells or uh, manure or any of these different ways uh, of using. So there is no word for the differentiation between organic and not organic. That's a Western way of being in the world. So, uh, you know, I work with Chef Walter Whitewater and he's always like, you know, well, food sovereignty, you know, it really goes back to Europe in the in the 80s. That's where food sovereignty was brought in. It's an academic term. And I think the 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 answer is no, people don't need to have a PhD. They can be experts in just their own indigenous knowledge. And we have to revere that and make room for that indigenous science and give it validity. 
Can I ask you one other term? Sure. Uh, uh, okay. I'm a retired um, teacher and I did a lot of environmental programs with my students here in New Mexico. And we, we use the, the term steward a lot in trying to help children understand how they could take care of their yard, their neighborhood, the schoolyard, et cetera. I heard you say that word steward a little while ago. And in a recent conversation with environmental educators, we started wondering about that term itself. Again, whose perspective is that representing? And it's a pretty important word in our environmental studies. I'm just curious what you, how you think about that word steward or stewardship. Yeah, I, I think it's fine. I mean, we could say caretaker, we could say, um, uh, you know, earth person, we could call it nurturing, we could call it uh, um, being uh, uh, a family member to the plants or animals or community that we're a part of. And so, it, you know, again, the bicycle wheel, I, so, you know, if, if we want to teach kids or adults or college students how to take care of uh, our planet, um, then, you know, steward is one way, caretaker is another, um, you know, mother or maiden is another. It's all different ways of looking at this way of nurturing um, our, our land, our earth, each other. And I, I personally feel that it doesn't matter how you explain it, as long as the concept gets across. Thank you. Me personally. Thank you, Molly. And another, I would say is community member. Basically as a collective, as a community, as amongst us all, we all contribute to some extent. Uh, so certainly there are those who have uh, the abilities at different levels, whether it's physical level or a mental level, everyone does their part. Um, uh, I, I, I'm reminded of a, of a statement or a quote that um, not every, not every, not, um, not um, no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. So not everyone has to be the responsible person for everything but you have to do your part as a collective, as part of a collective community. So again, Molly, thank you very much. And uh, we will try not to disturb your granddaughter, all right? So, so that you can get some uh, John, rest you know, another really good analogy would be, uh, I, I, I'm a community member and my community lives on the Rio Grande and we are stewards. We are caretaking for the Rio Grande, but our neighbors to the North are polluting it and our neighbors to the south are polluting it. So how much difference do we make if we're only doing a small portion? You only see a difference when the north and the south and those of us that are already stewards, if we wanna use Molly's words, uh, we have to work collectively. We have to work in tandem. We have to work uh, in collaboration. We have to work together uh, to make a difference. Otherwise we don't make a difference. So again, uh, we put another invitation out for anyone who'd like to join us, if there's anybody here. Okay, tell you what, um, let me uh, turn my screen around here. One of our um, well-respected uh, uh, participants to the book club is, joins us here. Um, can you come up here a little bit? If, if, uh, if you, um, I'm gonna turn, oops, wrong one, wrong, wrong button. Here we go. Um, Joyce has been um, participating with our book club for quite some time. So let me um, turn my screen around here. Joyce, uh, can I move a little bit to you this way? There you go. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. Okay. The, my question, you were asking conundrums, and then this leads into a couple of different things. My conundrum has been trying to eat healthy for years, and I have a woman with a lot of vegetables, and I grew little vegetables. But I have a friend from San Domingo, or she was out, who was raised in a federal, she's half. And she's been making me food through the whole pandemic and healthy stuff. You know, when we bite, we bite that there's a new brown rice. She's always adding a lot of vegetables. And then thinking of this book, I said, she asked what I wanted to make. I said, what about Indian food? She said, I can't do it because you need so many vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing. And then thinking about that, of course, they wouldn't know the word because they didn't have any stuff to put in the food. We didn't have to sell. So, anyway, how do I 
always I was looking quickly at the recipes of the book, and there's not very many vegetables. And of course, maybe they didn't have them until you started growing them all with other influences. But anyway, can you comment on that? So the, I, I don't know if you did you hear that, Lois? Uh, sort of. Okay, well, uh, um, Joyce wanted to know, well, she uh, was um, limited in her ability to go out during the co uh, COVID, and one of her friends who comes from the uh, Kiwa or Santa Domingo has prepared for food for her, and she suggested some of the uh, recipes from the book, but the, her comment was, well, the, it's going to take too much vegetables, and so Joyce was wondering, um, why there does not appear to be a whole lot of vegetables uh, in many of the recipes that are in the book. Or I wanted to know if you have any suggestions. Or, or suggestions how you can incorporate um, yeah. more vegetables. That's thinking of collaboration and incorporation. But I just thought it was interesting. Okay, so you have to remember this book came out in 2002. It's now 2022, so it's 20 years old. Oh. And my new book, which I'm handing the manuscript in on May 20th, is a completely plant-based book. And that book is how to make, uh, so we're calling it seed to plate, soil to sky, modern Native American recipes using ancestral ingredients. So we are moving into a time now where we're letting go of the dairy, we're letting go, I don't make fry bread anymore, I make something called no fry fry bread. And there was actually a question, um, Let's see, from uh, uh, Gita, uh, what about fry bread? So we, we do, um, we don't do fry bread anymore. We do um, uh, no fry fry bread. Um, and we're very plant forward, more and more and more and more and more doctors are saying plant forward. But you have to remember corn, bean, squash, chili, tomato, potato, vanilla, cacao, they're all plants. So. Uh, tons of vegetables and, um, uh, you know, uh, it's not salad greens. We do have wild greens. We have wild spinach. We have quiletes. So, you know, um, and then there was another question in here from Dawn Adams, who's Choctaw. And, um, you know, she's talking about eating our traditional foods. And I definitely am a proponent of uh, what is in our own ancestral DNA. What foods can we eat that feels good? Um, where I differ from some other native chefs. So some native chefs are what we would call only doing pre-colonial or pre-contact foods. And I work with low income uh, recipients of FDPIR or WIC or SNAP-ED. And some of the introduced foods that uh, Europeans gave us are very healthy and very inexpensive. So rather than be strictly pre-colonial and only eat a pre-contact diet, uh, I'm an advocate of what is the healthiest and what is the most accessible to our community members. So for instance, uh, uh, Dawn talks about wheat. Many people have a problem with wheat. And if you don't do well with wheat, Walter does horrible with wheat, it, you should go corn because you're native. I used to be married to an Irish Scotsman. Not only could he eat wheat, he could drink a pint of milk and go to bed. If I drink a pint of milk, I gurgle for hours. I'm lactose intolerant. I can't drink milk like that. If I'm going to suffer, it's definitely not going to be for a pint of milk. It's going to be for a little dollop of whipped cream or a little tiny bit of ice cream or something that's worth suffering for. There you go. I, I like the word you use, worth suffering for. That's great. Right? Um, uh, 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 let's bring, um, can we bring on Dawn? I like I like to just say hello to her. Uh, if we can bring on Dawn, um, Monique. Let's see if we can bring on Dawn here for us. Uh, are you there, Dawn? I think so. <laughs> yes, I, we can hear you fine. Okay. <laughs> well, tell 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 us where you're at, Dawn. I'm in extreme northwestern Nebraska, about 50 miles south of the Black Hills. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And um, did you have a follow-up question for Lois? Uh, she did comment on the, the question you put in chat. Was there a follow-up question or something that we can help you with? Well, I no, I really like that answer. Uh, the, you know, the 
one of the things to consider is accessibility of uh, the different kinds of ingredients. And, um, you know, I just, I've just seen this sort of split that I, I've been trying to navigate between, on the one hand, people going back to a completely pre-colonial diet and they seem to have really wonderful health results. And on the other hand, people sort of um, really manufacturing a, an all new sort of indigenous cuisine that uses traditional ingredients with, with other ingredients from other cultures and cooking them in all new ways. And they make these really um, fabulous, but very, very different kinds of foods. And I see the advantages to both of them. And I think about what I want to prepare for my own family. And I get kind of high centered on which way I should go. And um, so I really like the idea that, of course, there's the practical issue of what's really available to me to use in my own household, in my own kitchen. And, um, you know, like I, I cannot, I can't handle wheat and things like that. So that's easy to solve. But, um, but, you know, just thinking it philosophically, you know, what, what cookbook do I want to try to follow? <laughs> so I was, I was kind of curious about that. And I, I like your take on it that, you know, look at it practically. That makes a lot of sense. So um, for instance, first of all, there are four distinct periods of native cuisine, pre-colonial or pre-contact, first contact, foods introduced, and depending on where you are, we're speaking English, so we know the English had a big impact, right? Our country is English, uh, at least in language. Uh, but here in the Southwest, the Spanish. And then if you go into Canada or areas in the North, the French, right? Uh, further South, uh, you know, we see um, the Portuguese. So um, foods were introduced. The biggest and most profound are probably domesticated animals and their byproducts. Uh, so, you know, but sheep are now inseparable with the identity of Navajo people. So who am I to say to a Navajo person, you can't eat sheep, that was an introduced food. Okay. It's been there for 500 years. It's like telling the Italian who eats the tomato that was introduced by native people that they can't eat the tomato. Or so even, I am I, more of the school of um, what foods were introduced that are healthy and what foods of those foods are in our FTPIR or SNAP-Ed or WIC programs. We have oranges, we have apples, we have ginger, we have turmeric, we have olive oil, we have um, cabbage, we have beets, all of which are very, very healthy. And so if we have access to those, I and those are distributed through the food programs, I'm going to come up with recipes to use those, even though it's not part of the pre-colonial diet. I find that being on a a strictly pre-colonial diet is very difficult and very expensive. And a lot of our native community members can't do it. They can't afford to eat only wild game and only uh, some of the foods that are, are part of that. So why not utilize, here we are in 2022, utilize foods that are healthy. Oranges are very healthy, not orange juice, right? <laughs> orange juice has a lot of sugar, but if you take one to two ounces and add that juice to water, it's healthy. We just don't want that much sugar, right? So again, part of what I do in my education is looking at what's available and then how do we make it taste good? How do we make it so that uh, people who have access to those can eat it and be healthy native people? And everybody has a choice, right? Do you want fry bread? Do you want wheat in your diet? Corn tortillas are perfectly healthy. And if you don't do well with wheat, then I advocate that you shouldn't use it. But for the people that do like wheat or the people that went to boarding school or elders that fry bread to them is a comfort food, I'm going to show them how to not fry it and grill it so that if they're going to eat it, I'm going to show them a healthier way to do that. Not just me personally. Other chefs are doing completely different things and ways of being in the world. Well, thank you, Don. Hey, Don, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What in your culture, what is a very common uh traditional food for you in, in your within your culture corn everything <laughs> <laughs> okay corn everything all right is there yeah. anyone specific that you say okay I, this is the one i know my 
my grandmother had, my mother had, now I have. Is there anything in particular? Oh man, well, Bana is the typical Choctaw bread, but I really grew up on cornbread, um, which of course is, is a, a variant that's got uh, wheat flour in it and eggs and milk, right. but, um, but corn and beans, I was raised on cornbread and beans and um, that's a really traditional kind of meal for us. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Don. And hopefully you'll, you'll get a chance to join us again. Uh, if you'd like to be part of the book club, uh, send me an email and I'll put you in our email listing of, of participants. All right, Don? Thank you. Oh, it's great. And thank you very much for visiting with us. Uh, before we continue on, I just want to uh, take a, just a moment here to remind everyone, this is the May 2022 uh, edition of the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center's Pueblo Book Club. We meet here every second Tuesday, both in person, like let me show you here, all our people who are here joining us. Oops, Roman, wrong button. Uh, uh, all the, so everybody wave your hand. Wave, there you go, there. These are the people who join us every, oh, well, not every, but most of the time we have uh, people visiting us here at the Cultural Center, as well as those, there, and I see right now there's 14, 17 people joining us via um, Zoom, as well as um, another person has joined us here on Facebook. And right now I have 101 people who have joined us on Facebook, Kathy, Nancy, Marion, Jeanette, uh, Teresa, Lori, Luis, Connie, Carol, and many others. We invite you to join us in many forms here at the Pueblo Book Club. So um, we'll, I'll be talking about next month's book as well, but let's continue with our program. You know, um, Dawn brought up a very, uh, statement then you elaborated on it um lois about and then you ex uh, said that italians would not have had tomato sauce unless without the assistance of native problem solvers because now we have tomatoes we could say the same thing with pasta because pasta comes from asia uh, before pasta was even in italy it was in asia so that's that commonality that ability to share with commerce with ideas and certainly ways of giving this information along. And with that said, Lois, you mentioned about how you're passing this information along. What are the avenues and what is it the ways that you're sharing this, this indigenous food knowledge? Uh, do you talk to educators? Do you go, do you give presentations? What are the things you're doing to help pass this information along? So we do, we have uh, sponsors that bring us into communities. Um, the New Mexico Department of Health, which I'm working with, uh, we have a contract to train all of the cooks in every tribal senior center in the state. Uh, Beautiful. We are definitely working with Zuni. We've been working on dates uh, to try and go out there and do a two day training with the cooks. So we show the cooks how to make everything from, you know, a meal, uh, maybe that's a, um, a soup or a stew or let's say you uh, roast a chicken, instead of throwing away the bones, how do you make a bone broth or a stock from that? And then you not only extend the process, but you uh, make uh, nutritious and delicious foods uh, in the kitchen. And we found that, you know, a lot of cooks don't have training. So knife skills are important. How to cut an onion is important. I know this sounds very basic, but uh, a lot of what we do is, um, working with these trainings, we call it train the trainer. I think the last thing we want to do is make people dependent, but what we do want to do is make people independent, right? So once they have the skills, then all we have to do is go in once every other year and do a, a follow-up training uh, with new ideas, new recipes. Um, and, you know, Dawn brought up the cornbread. Uh, my cookbook has a recipe for cornbread, same thing. That's how I, what I grew up with, you know, uh, buttermilk and butter and uh, um, eggs. And in my new book, it's completely plant-based. So we came up with a way of using applesauce to keep the cornbread moist without using eggs and using chia, which is native uh, mm -hmm. and very healthy. It's one of the super foods. Uh, and so we don't, and then we use a plant-based milk and that plant-based milk, it could be almond, it could be oat. Uh, I really like oats. So oats are technically, again, 
one of those introduced foods, but they're inexpensive, they're very healthy, uh, and many Native Americans do not have a problem, whereas they do have a problem with animal-based milks. So if, if there was an organization or some entity that said, you know, we could benefit from what you uh, provide and what your kinds of, like you said, train the trainer um, protocols and curriculum, how can someone uh, participate or connect with you? Uh, so, you know, we also do small private groups. Um, we do do, you know, we work with health educators. So diabetes educators, the community health representatives, uh, the cooks and senior centers, the cooks and Head Start programs, the cooks and hospitals. We've worked on the Navajo Nation. Uh, President Nez is very plant forward. You know, the Navajo Nation is the only nation that uh, implemented a junk food tax. So if you want to buy junk food, we're going to charge you a little extra. And they're the only uh, nation that's ever done that. So, you know, people are stepping up and people are participating and uh, it's a slow process. There's no fix at all. It's going to take some time. Uh, but I think we're moving in that direction. You know, before COVID, I taught uh, an indigenous food class at IAIA that's on hiatus because we want to get uh, COVID under control. You know, anytime you do a hands-on food class, people are all together and touching and breathing. And so we're really focused on waiting till it's safe. But uh, um, all of this will go back uh, to that. And you know, you're never too young and you're never too old to learn how to cook, right? Never too right, old, exactly. never too young. Never too young. Uh, well, while we um, proceed on to the next um, part of our segment of our program, I'd like to invite again many of the uh, 17 participants who are joining us via Zoom. Uh, if you have a comment or a question or if anybody else here still wants to ask a question, all right, go ahead, come up here. Uh, let me just move my camera around here so I can switch this around. And wait a minute, let me switch here so that people can see who you're talking to. Introduce yourself. Wait a minute, let's see where are we at. Introduce yourself and we'll go back a little bit that way. There you go. No, this way. There you go. Right. Tell us who you are and um, go ahead. I'm Ginger Forrester. Oh, Ginger. I thank you, Ginger. Yep. I live in Albuquerque, but I used to live in the Northern Plains, the Dakotas. And I want, I'd like to know what the title of your new book is. All right. Uh, you may not have heard that, Alois, but uh, Ginger here asked, uh, a little bit about, uh, could you tell her about the, your new book and um, give us some information about that. All right, Lois. Okay, so the new book is called Seed to Plate, Soil to Sky, Modern Plant-Based Native American Recipes Using Ancestral Ingredients. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm handing the manuscript in in May. Uh, it has a release date, although we don't have an official release date in 2023. It takes about a year to design and print and then have the books come over on a container, which we know is very difficult right now. Uh, and so um, Hachette Books is uh, the publisher, and it is a completely plant-based, plant-forward book. So you obviously, hopefully, you'll, we'll keep in contact. And so, for those uh, individuals and participants who are interested in knowing when the book will be released, you'll let us know, right, Lois? Yes, of course. Oh, terrific. Okay. And, and so, did you? Someone else had a? Yeah. Let me uh, turn my camera around here. We have another participant here, uh, in the, uh, oops, oh, wrong button, in our um, studio audience here. Uh, if you would, uh, state your name and um, go ahead. Hi, I'm Bryson from Albuquerque. And the other day we were reminiscing when I lived in another state, we started a group, started a garden in the preschool and found that there was quite an impact on the students because they would eat things from the garden when they knew it was the garden and they would play in the garden and see things grow. And I wondered um, if there's any uh, companion program in the, in the schools or in the areas that are also teaching how to plant and grow some of these foods. 
Oh, thank you. Did you get that, Alois? Yeah, I, I don't know um, locally. I do know that Healthy Kids, Healthy Communities does have a garden program and they do have funding for Pueblos to uh, install gardens. And, you know, uh, it, it's more on a national level than just only a local level. I know uh, Laguna has a wonderful garden. Zuni has a wonderful garden. Shiprock has a wonderful garden. Uh, and what we've been doing uh, with the state is helping these small communities get vetted. So when I say vetted, in order to sell produce, let's say you're growing lettuce, to the Zuni school system, you have to be approved through the state. And so the state has a program where we're helping these small farms. So the Zuni community garden farm can get approved to sell to the Zuni school. Shiprock has done the same thing. Um, and that way they're vetted, they're approved on a state level to be able to sell to the senior center, to the school, to the Head Start, if a community has a hospital, uh, whatever it is. And so that's been a big initiative on a very local level. And then I've been working with uh, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in North Carolina. And one of the elders there as part of a, they had a, a project called Healthy Roots Project where they had 200 plots all in one area of small gardens and you could sign up for a plot and then it was became this large area that was collective. And uh, Joseph Al, Joey Al from uh, EBCI uh, stated, how sovereign are we if we can't feed ourselves? And then he went on to say, as our tribe progresses with gardening and agricultural initiatives, I would like to see all families and individuals of this tribe create their own garden. At least with their own garden, a family or individual would then be producing some of the food that they consume within a year with the ultimate goal is to have all the food we consume in a year be produced within our own boundary. It's a lofty goal, but nonetheless, a goal to strive towards. And I think that that's a really good way of making a statement uh, for not only food sovereignty, but health and wellness uh, as native communities start to uh, work towards health and wellness and, and on initiatives uh, on feeding ourselves. And, um, you know, each gardening, I mean, back East, they have water, right? Here we don't. So you can look at the traditional corn, you can look at Pueblo corn or Hopi corn, and they have elongated roots that can go up to 24 inches deep. Whereas the East Coast corn, native corn, has very shallow roots because they have water. So they want to mound, they want the water to go off, and here, Zuni is famous for waffling. We want our corn to have a well so that it can build up during the rains and it can nourish itself. So again, that's the science. That's the TEK. That's uh, in, an indigenous way of being in the world. And just like we've adapted to our environments, if you live in Phoenix, 90 degrees is kind of cool, right? Because in the summer, it's 113. <laughs> Uh, kind of, I, kind of. I'll say kind of. Yeah. We'll, we'll be kind, kind of. I mean, my sister married a Norwegian and they go to Norway uh, in July and it's 40 degrees and they're jumping in the fjords and they think it's summer. My sister's like, ooh, it's not <laughs> So, you know, again, just like plants and animals, as humans, we adapt to our environment and it's all. Uh, perspective, but um, the corn here is a very specialized dry farming corn, whereas East Coast corn, the Iroquois white corn or the um, uh, Eastern Band of Cherokee Indian corn uh, is a, a water corn. So it's used to having lots of water. And probably if we planted it here, it wouldn't do very well. Just like our dry land corn would probably not do well in a very wet environment. It would start to mold. That would be my guess. Well, you know, that's just a confirmation of the fact of how humans have problem solved. They've found the better outcomes. And then that gene of corn that works best in this environment will not work in the other board. That's, again, problem solving that humans have always done that. And again, again, re reinforces really what the emphasis you're talking about in trying to help develop others have this food sovereignty consciousness, this ability to say, without our foods that are traditional, we cannot survive as a culture. 
uh, and as a group of people. And I would just want to let you know that if you give any other trainings in any of the places, I'll be glad to volunteer to become a food taster. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I will certainly uh, perhaps even consider taking the day off, maybe without even without pay, just to be the uh, make sure we make sure there's quality control make sure no one gets sick i'll be glad to sacrifice my overall health so that that what you do lois it, it, it's it, people will benefit from but i'll be glad to sacrifice myself for that okay so you know where i live now i'm, I'm going to read up another um quote that i had um in the, in the book that i wanted to um kind of point out and again this again i Certainly, I have my own recipes that I probably benefit from looking at the book from yours, Lois, but I gained the most from your, um, the, the preface and the forward. I, I read the words and they, they connected with me. So I'm going to read this. Oh, I, is that the one? Uh, no, I, I got to read another one here. Here we go. This is the one that I want to read to you. It says, the foods I write about were not only important in the past, but are also critical to the future. We are finding that native foods are virtually important or vitally, apologize, vitally important to the health and well-being of the indigenous peoples of the region. And again, that says to me that uh, how we exist as a culture, and again, not just native cultures, but you're right about being Greek, about being from Asia uh, and other cultures, what helps them identify those groups of people and really what is really one of the core messages of the Indian Public Cultural Center is our sense of place, where we be, where we are, who we are as human beings and as a culture and as a society. Certainly the ceremonies are important, uh, the languages are important, but it's the nourishment of the foods that we have that not just nourishes us physically, the body, but certainly the spirit and the soul. So that, that statement kind of stuck with me in reading that part, Lois. Yeah, you know, um, some of the uh, educators uh, say that um, health and wellness is actually four parts, right? So we can look at the medicine wheel, uh, you know, yellow, white, black, wet, red. Those are the colors of corn. Those are the races of man. Those are the, that's the circle. Turtle Island fits within that. But, you know, when we, uh, look at this idea of uh, how this works. Um, you know, food is our medicine. Food is part of it, but it's not only food. I mean, you can eat the healthiest food, but um, it has to be all body or, or so there's, there's um, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. And those are the four ways of being healthy. And so how people do that, uh, there's, again, no one way uh, to do that, no right way to do that. It's different for each community, um, but it's all connected. You can't take out uh, um, the wellness of uh, people without having the land that they live on be well and healthy. You can't um, be a healthy person unless you have some sort of connection to whatever your spirituality is, um, because that keeps you in balance in terms of a, a belief system. And so again, there's no one way, uh, everybody does it slightly differently, but there are components just like there are on the medicine wheel to uh, complete health and wellness. And it includes all of those. And you said language, ceremonies, you know, uh, nutrition. So there, there are right three of those four. So that's, you know, spiritual, that's uh, physical, that's emotional, and then mental, you know, how do we look at the world? And I think, you know, COVID taught me something. Um, and that was that, uh, you know, we have no control over what happens outside of us where we have control is how we react or respond to what happens outside of us. We can allow it to devastate us or we can turn lemons into lemonade. Um, one of the things I did during COVID was, you know, we started to do virtual events. We started Zooming and teaching 
and uh, you know, I was still making food sometimes twice the recipe. So I had food for 12 and myself and Walter, he actually got stuck here. So he moved into my guest room for six months because he couldn't go back to the reservation. It was just too risky. But anyway, uh, so we had food. And for the first time, I really got to know my neighbors um, because I was working in my studio kitchen, not in my commercial kitchen. Everything came to a screeching halt. And uh, I realized I have a 94 year old uh, a block away and my next door neighbors 84 and alone and another couple in their late 70s and nobody wanted to leave they were very scared and so for a little over a year I fed them every time we did an event and uh, one of the the 84 year old son called and said I think you saved my mom's life because you fed her you kept her connected to something some of them don't know how to use instacart some of them you know I mean all of this stuff some of us grew up with nuns and a ruler. You know, we didn't have computers. We didn't have uh, Instacart and all of these things. And so, um, you know, rather than make it devastating, I said, what an opportunity. Uh, another family down the block, you know, she had surgeries during COVID. She wasn't well, she couldn't cook for her family. So just constantly, especially when I was testing recipes for the cookbook, and what an opportunity to be able to provide um, food for health and wellness during a very, very, very difficult time. So uh, I, I feel blessed that um, Creator gave me that chance to do that. Well, again, uh, we, we can certainly appreciate many of the individuals in our families who cook. Like my mom, when she cooked, she cooked uh, some of the same things that I hold just dear to me. And I, I remember the kinds of cooks, the kinds of food she created. And some of her relatives will always say, oh, your mom did this, or your mom cooked this. She always had this. And they can always say, oh, she, especially one of the one things that I think my mom was kind of well known for were her molasses cookies. They, everybody comes and says, oh, you remember your mom? Your mom always made those molasses cookies. So I guess that's the legacy of my mom that many people who are our relatives where I come from, they oftentimes associate that connection with us. So that we, as as you say, the the talents and the skill sets and the gift that Creator has provided, pro offers you those unique opportunities to give back to others and not realize to what extent you're helping others. So I want to bring up another uh, quote here. Um, again, I got all this from the uh, the uh, preface. Uh, this goes back to what we have been talking about, especially as it applies to corn. And I, I don't know if you can see this, but let me read it to you here, Lois. It says, the miracle of corn is that it grows in the Southwest desert at all, particularly on some of the arid mesas. But, but with a history going back thousands of years, it has enabled the indigenous peoples of the Southwest to sustain life and to evolve as individual cultures. And I think what happens for those who have the opportunity to visit us here at the Indian Public Cultural Center. Hopefully we can provide information that changes what their perspective of who Native people are, especially as it applies to uh, the Pueblo cultures. Oftentimes we do get unusual statements like, well, do you guys live in teepees? <laughs> or, um, you know, they talk, uh, one of the things I mentioned to our guests when they do come here, I talk about certain things that were not here in the Southwest before Europeans came. And one of them is horses. There was no horses here. And so I'll say, well, if you wanted to create an issue for your neighbor over there, or you wanted to kind of cause them issues over here, well, you just had to run faster than the other guy because there was no horse or mule or donkey here. Everybody had the same tools. And then they think about, well, well, the river's there. Did you guys have canoes? Well, you know, probably, we don't know. We just don't know. So they're changing the whole different paradigm of idea of who Pueblo people are. So with that statement about corn, it causes people to rethink about who Native people are, about do they, like I said, do they sleep in teepees? Do they wear feathers in their hair? Uh, you know, uh, do they do braids? Just unusual statements and comments like that. So um, that's what this particular 
um, statement and they bring it up again here. Oops, what happened to my picture there? Oh, wrong one. Okay, there we go. There we go. Again, the miracle of corn is that it grows in the Southwest at all. And it's through corn, it's through the problem solving ability of what these peoples had uh, to way to sustain and maintain their cultures. So I, I looks like um, Alan, uh, I mean, uh, Lois has taken a little bit of a break. So um, does anybody else have a comment? Let me see if we have some of our participants here still with us here on the Zoom. Does anybody would like to make a comment or question? I see, um, well, Dawn gave a comment. If you want to make another comment, Dawn. I have Jamie, um, uh, Linda on our, our um, still with us on our Zoom. And let me check with here on, um, I was checking on Facebook. I, I have, actually I have um, Eugene who joined us from Humble, Texas. Anybody been to Humble, Texas? I haven't. Uh, who joined us from Humble, Texas. Um, maybe he'll uh, have an opportunity to perhaps call in and join us by Zoom as well. So um, uh, as I was mentioning, Lois, how that statement about corn has contributed to the uniquenesses of these distinct cultures. And so uh, I just wanted to see how you would comment on that. Um, uh, I... Um, I'd like you to chime in on that. I'd like you to say a couple of words in that rather than me. Well, I, I will begin. First of all, I'll let you know that I'm a science teacher and I look at science both certainly from your perspective, as you said, that indigenous wisdom, but also as a science teacher, I can describe photosynthesis, the exchange of molecules and what it takes for a plant to use chloroplasts and then change it into oxygen and use CO2. And then I can, you, we talk about what we call nitrogen fixation. It's that collective ability that corn, beans and squash have that we can look at the root level and see that without nitrogen fixation that beans and squash help now the corn grow that we see the ability to have uh, what we call water soluble nitrates be able to be absorbed through the plant. And so when we have lightning come through, it changes what we call nitrite NO2 into nitrate NO3, which is soluble. And that's what we use for fertilizer now. When you go buy fertilizer, it consists of ammonium nitrate because that's water soluble. If it stayed as NO2, it's not as easily water soluble. So I look at science that way, but at the same time, I remember when I was a kid, I, I helped my grandmother on our garden. We planted corn and beans and squash. We irrigated. So I have that cultural connection. So I see this connection with corn, not necessarily sacred, but essential, paramount. Without corn, none of these civilizations would have existed in the Western hemisphere and we grant uh, we, we acknowledge that wheat sustained the Eastern Hemisphere. Without wheat, the citizens and civilizations in the Eastern Hemisphere would not have become what they became. On this side of the world, we trip that to corn and that's why we hold it in a great degree of respect, a great amount of sacredness that without corn, we realize it would not have allowed us to be these East distinct communities that we see today. So I look at it both from that perspective as a teacher of science, but at the same time, understanding how culturally connected it is to us that allows me to be here, that if I talk about corn and say the words of my ancestors, it's just a perpetuation of the culture that preceded me. So I'm fortunate to be here because of, simply because of them. And so that's how I would respond to that statement that I saw in your book. Anybody else have another comments or question? Just uh, anybody out there? Oh, I see here someone put me a, can you see that up on your screen there? Um, is it Gian? Hopefully I pronounce this right. Let's, can we bring, uh, is it Gian uh, on, 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 there she is. Hi. Hi. 
Tell us where you're, uh, make sure I pronounce your name first correctly, okay? Oh, it's Gian, yes. Gia, okay, Gia, okay. And tell us where you're joining us from, Gia. Uh, from Santa Fe. Oh, well, thank you. Go ahead. So um, I'm just loving the conversation about um, new ways to think about native foods and going back and looking at um, what has been in the native knowledge forever you know, uh, you know, planting, uh, you know, how, how certain crops get planted together, how certain things get used, um, you know, certain recipes, that kind of thing. And then having it, ha having a science, quote, science around what that has really, uh, you know, from a Western standpoint or from, you know, a, a European standpoint, um, what that scientifically means. Um, so I'm, I'm really enjoying that conversation because often there's a, um, a discussion point where there's sort of one side versus another and this offers an opportunity to show that there's a connectivity between these two sort of methodologies or philosophies. Thank you, uh, uh, Gia. Appreciate that. Um, while we're waiting, if there's anybody else who would like to make another comment, I see someone in the chat there. But I want to um, bring this up here. We had Adrienne join us from London. She, she says, hello from London. Though sadly I cannot stay on any longer as it's 10 a.m. 10 p.m. here, yeah, there in the UK. Before I, wanted, before I go, I just wanted to uh, say a giant thank you to Lois. I appreciate your work and perspective. I too am a anthropologist, now food and culture writer here in the UK, a former resident of New Mexico. When my when your amazing new book comes out, please let me know if you ever plan to visit uh, your uh, visit your publishers here, as I would love to hear help you create a relevant event. There's so much to be celebrated with your work, and I see a real hunger and interest here. So uh, thank you very much, Adrienne. I appreciate it for joining us for London. So we can add London to our little map of participants from Thailand and other places throughout the world. We thank you very much. And uh, Gia, again, thank you for your comment. Let me see, um, I see someone else. Let me close this window here and open up this other window here. Oh, no one's there. I thought I saw someone. It's, um, Monique, is there anybody that wanted to participate or uh, contribute to the discussion uh, of the list of people that you have there? I'm not sure she can hear me. She's, uh, she's muted there. Let's see where we are with our time. We want to go on our time. No, I think you time? got everyone, John. I'm sorry, say again? I said, I think you got everyone that was on the list. Okay. Um, so lastly, as we get ready to uh, move on, the, as we get kind of wind around the hour of our second hour, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, Lois, uh, you know, in the book, we talk about our Navajo neighbors, our your Apache inclusion of the culture there, and our, certainly our Pueblo communities. Have you had any type of uh, response or feedback from any of these communities that have engaged and says, no, maybe you were not completely, truly representative? Was there any feedback in that regard? Because I, I'll tell you what, sometimes many of our uh, authors that we write, that we have books that we use. There are some within our communities that are um, still concerned about the distribution of information we share with the public. Is it, is it, is it for us to share? And so that was my concern or my con one of my thoughts as I was thinking about talking with you today, Lois. So um, I had permission from everybody on the recipes or what I talked about, I was very careful not to talk about uh, spiritual uh, realms or ways of being in the world that people did not want to share. Um, and uh, I think when this book came out, you have to remember there were no very few, <laughs> let's say very, very few uh, books on Native American cuisine. Um, and I think uh, putting the foods of the Southwest Indian nations and all the nations that make up the Southwest, people were so thrilled to validate the cuisine and talk about the cuisine 
um, that uh, we received mostly praise um, as opposed to criticism. So you did get this from that, and that's really one of the, I guess you'd say the essential parts of um, when we talk about our culture, we certainly, people do ask us, uh, obviously they come from all around the world. They come to the Indian Public Cultural Center. They ask questions and certainly we want to help provide some edification so that we can address stereotypes so that we can sort of provide them more knowledge about who the culture is, but at the same time being respectful, being accountable for the terms and the words we use, which is really something that sometimes people aren't always uh, comfortable with. Um, and I, one good way to sort of uh, address this on, I guess you would say this erroneous perspective of this thing called uh, critical race theory is we should be able to provide information so it helps everybody understand but at the same time being having set boundaries so that okay i can tell you this but i, I really um you don't need to know everything I'm, I'm i'm a steward of it as the as we were talking earlier about being a steward it's my responsibility and for the knowledge and the wisdom i share so that's um i think perhaps one of the things that perhaps you encountered too as well correct lois yeah and um, it looks like we have another question from Gita, who's asking me again to address the fry bread question, which I thought I addressed, but uh, fry bread is native. It's native from the government issue period. So when native people were relocated, they were issued rations. You have to look at the Trail of Tears. You have to look at the Long Walk. You have to look at the Navajo that were imprisoned in a camp and the government issued flour, lard, sugar, coffee, and canned meat, including spam and corned beef and sometimes pork. So because these were foods that they didn't know, they developed a recipe, which was a survival food. That survival food is fry bread. Every community has to make a decision now today. Do they want to include that from the government issue period in their cuisine. And I can't answer that for them. Um, I do no fry fry bread. I never cook fry bread. So some communities still love fry bread, fry bread power, some don't. You know, fry bread represents survival of the ancestors. If they didn't come up with a fry bread recipe, they would have perished, Correct. they would have died. So it's a survival food, but it's also a food that represents uh, colonization, subjugation, uh, imprisonment. And so, each community is going to have to make a decision. Do they want that on their plate? Do they want that on their menu? And I think for the first time in history, Native communities are addressing it. Yes, we want it or no, we don't. And that's an individual community decision all over the United States. Uh, and um, all I can do is tell you what I do. I do no fry fry bread, but I will sit on the curb and eat an Indian taco during Indian market here in San Jose, <laughs> New Mexico once a year, and then I don't eat it again for the whole year. So, you know, we missed out because of COVID, but now uh, it's coming back and I'll probably go this August and sit on the curb and eat my one fried Indian taco that I don't do at any other time because uh, for health and wellness, I find it greasy and uh, I don't feel well when I eat fried foods. It's not just fried bread, anything fried. French fries, delicious. But do you feel good after you eat it? I don't. So uh, again, um, fry bread is native. It's native from the government issue period. So, right. uh, and, so and I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Gita, uh, hopefully the answer is for your question, Gita. But you know, you, you use the word colonization, imperialism, oppression, but I guess we could also say it is resilience that with what resources were provided in the, such a dire strait, that problem solving says our strongest desire is for continuance. And the only way we can do, continue with even just the culture, the language, and making it just to the next day is the best way we can do that is perhaps by finding a way to do something called 
but we now call Pride Britain. And you're I, right. Yeah, you're right. I think it's brilliant. I think that they did a brilliant job making a recipe that sustained, uh, filled up people's bellies. You know, and, and Native aren't the only ones. Look at every culture. Everybody has a fried bread. Look at donuts. Look at the little Italian balls that they fry and put powdered sugar on that they serve at the Feast of San Gennaro. And look at, you know, I mean, every culture has something that's fried. Look at Jewish tradition, right? Latkes are fried potatoes during, uh, you know, you use the oil. So every culture has a fried version of something. The question is, how often can you eat it? You can't eat it every day. Now we know that, right? No. It creates right. heart disease and obesity and diabetes. And so we really want to limit our fat intake and make it special. We call that a sometimes food, potato chips, sometimes oh, okay. food. Oh, no, you're giving me a new term, sometimes, sometimes food. food. I'll do that now, sometimes food. Right. Okay, so when my partner tells me I can't eat this or eat that, I'll say, oh no, it's just my sometimes food. Okay, so I don't know what to do. Well, I'll tell you what my sometimes food is, Lois, is when I drive from Gallup north towards, say, uh, Farmington, or if I decide to go to uh, Window Rock, I'll stop at this gas station and they have this fried bread wrapped in with some mutton. That's my sometimes food. Uh, and that's not tradition. That's not Laguna or Zuni food, but it sure is sometimes food. It's, uh, and I love it. And then when you throw on a slab of big flag of green chili, that's even better. So there you go. That will be my sometimes food. There you go. And we're all allowed to have sometimes foods. Yes, right. right? So, oh, who, who has a sometimes food here? Anybody? What's your sometimes food? Ice cream. Ice cream sometimes here. What? Also chocolate. Chocolate, okay. Dark. Indian taco. All right, and now, hey, you got another supporter here, Lois, so you guys can share your Indian tacos together. All right? Apple pie. Well, there you go. There's your apple pie, Lois. Actually, the other day I had apple pie here at the cultural center. It had green chili in it. It was fantastic. It was very good. It had green chili in it. So, so um, who is it? Does anybody out there in um, Zoom land? Let's see if anybody wants to give us, um, uh, who has, Jana, do you have a sometimes food? Linda, do you have a sometimes food? Uh, put it in the chat. Let's see if you guys can, can give us some sometimes food. So as we get ready, we got a few, about half, 15 minutes left. Yeah, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, I would like for you to kind of tell us a little bit more about uh, Red Mesa cuisine. Um, I see she moved away, but um, I did look up, on, let's see, somebody wrote something here. Ooh, let's see, somebody wrote um, ice cream. Jana wrote ice cream. So Jana has wrote in her sometimes food as ice cream. So I guess that's gonna be one of our new uh, catchphrases today, sometimes food. And then somebody wrote down ice cream, but difficulty with lactose. Oh yeah, everybody else, you and everybody else, okay. Um, I was wondering, um, Lois, could you, I, look, I did look through the whole website of Red Mesa Cuisine um, and uh, I know you told us a little bit about it earlier, but can you uh, tell us a little bit more about the goals, the mission of what uh, Red Mesa Cuisine is all about? So, um, you know, our mission is indigenous cuisine and cultural education. We don't cook food without educating on the culture. And uh, if, you know, if someone's getting married or they want to cater uh, for something, and uh, they don't want the educational component, then we're not the right person. We're not a good match. What we do and what Walter does, we bring in the element of education. We bring in the drum, we bring in song, we bring in prayer, we bring in food, we bring in you know, all of these components into food because they're inseparable. And we educate on why these things are important. Uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, a really good mission to have. So if say someone is interested in having a large uh, group of people and they want to cater you, uh, cater through you, they can just go to the website, correct? Yeah. Okay. All right. And, um, and we have a little store. You can buy books or buy some of the food products that we use from our local vendors and farms also on the website. And I was reading the website, it said that you even get rice up from Minnesota, Wisconsin, correct? Yes. And the wild rice, you know, they had very little water last year. So the price has gone up uh, 
between six and eight dollars a pound and they will run out so uh we're using it a little bit less um but we're still buying native okay all right oh before we um, go on a little bit more i just want to bring up also that we have uh another person join us on facebook a week because we cuss i hope i pronounced that correctly uh yellow thunderbird he joins us from seattle uh washington so we are really getting around so i want to thank everybody certainly those who are joined let me bring up my picture here so they again we can show all the people here who are joining us here at the cultural center uh, make sure you wave your hands there hello everybody these are the people that are joining us here at the cultural center and again, without the participation and the interest of many of our members, we're not, not a member, but just a participant, that the book club would not be as influential as well as helpful to many of our participants. So I wanna thank everybody, those who are joining us here at the Cultural Center in the Chaco One Room, as well as those who joined us here at uh, on, on the um, internet. So I see here, um, let's see, what do you see here? See, Gian said, do you have ash for blue corn bread? We have ash, we don't sell it. Uh, there are blue corn custom designs is a great place to buy ash. Walter and I make our, our own ash or uh, we get it from his community. Um, I also have a Hopi friend. I just bought five pounds of ash because I was testing the ash corn. So I have a stash now, uh, but you can get it online for everybody else. Oh yeah, and that brings me up to something you were mentioning about at some point eons ago that people found out that that's the best way to get the best nutrition out of corn because you had to get over the skin and that also then contributes to uh, having the best best opportunity for amino acids to then be utilized because if we simply don't um, prepare it in a way that we can benefit from uh, the nutrition that's inside the kernel then we simply eat it much like we've often eat, we eat a corn on the cob. A couple of days later, we see it in the toilet. Unless we really prepare it and know how to prepare it, we've gone through those kind of those Mikey moments where somebody realized, hey, you know, if I ash, use ash here, I can benefit from it. I, I get more nutrition out of it. Again, trial and error and process improvement. So that's really what, how different societies have always found best ways to find the foods that are beneficial for them. Um, yes, oh yes, yeah. My question is, what is ash exactly? Oh. I mean, I can like, you know. You, you have an idea in your head, but go ahead. Um, we have a, go ahead, raise your hand. She has a question, uh, Lois, um, what's your name? My name is Lonnie Smith. Lonnie Smith has a question, go ahead, are you, ask your question. What is ash exactly? I mean, I kind of even. Did you get that, uh, Lois? Okay. So it's literally ash from bushes that grow so Walter, uh, a lot of communities on the Navajo reservation use juniper. Uh, the Hopi love to use the four wing salt bush or the chamisa. Some of the Pueblos use the four wing salt bush as well as juniper here. Uh, different tribes use different ash, but you burn the branches uh, until it turns white and then you let it cool down and then you sift it. So there are no wood particles and that very fine powder after it has been sifted is the culinary ash that we use to cook with. Thank you. Yeah, so perhaps we can go out and prepare your own as well. Let's see where we are in time. Okay. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, Lois. So uh, if you can, um, are, do you have any final comments? Would you like to let us know a little bit more about, um, oh, um, the website, I'll give you the, ad for everybody, I'll give you, put the, on the web on the, our website, the address to Red, Red Mesa Cuisine so that you'll keep us updated on the release of the book, correct, Lois? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we can I, make sure you do that. Oh, I was wondering if we have some of our um, audience members here with their own book, perhaps, hopefully you'll get a chance to come by to the Cultural Center. I'd like to invite you to the Cultural Center. Certainly we can um, have your autograph on some of our books for you. We would appreciate that. Happy to do that next time I'm down. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Um, All right, good. I just wanna say thank you. And I, I think the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center is a treasure uh, certainly for all the Pueblos, but to all the people that become educated through the work that you all do. And uh, I'm a big supporter. I've been uh, associated with Indian Pueblo Cultural Center since uh, the early days of when the book came out and before that, and the restaurant is great. And I just wanna say thank you so much for 
uh, having me be here today. And thank you to everybody that tuned in and uh, let's all keep in touch. And thank you very much. All right, well, um, if you can, um, give us a website address and um, how can people get with, connect with you if you want to on Facebook? So Facebook, uh, Red Mesa Cuisine is our Facebook. Um, and then the website is www.redmesacuisine.com. And um, hopefully um, uh, you'll get, keep in contact with me. And so if you, you are gonna be down this way, connect with me and I'll let everyone know that you'll be here. So hopefully I, I'd like for my book to be autographed too. I would appreciate that. And as well as some of our others will be here as well. So um, it, just before we get ready to go, I wanna make sure that we, uh, um, this is the book that we'll be talking about next month. Um, this is called uh, In Search of Chaco. Um, right now, I did check with our book uh, store at the Indian Pueblo store. They are uh, out of it right now. Um, Andrew Thomas, uh, the, um, one of the sales associates with the book club, is trying to get some more. Uh, but if you would like to start reading it, what I do is I, if I don't have access to the book here at our bookstore, I try to hit our local book clubs or bookstores like Charlie's Under the Covers in Bernalillo, a book works over here on Rio Grande. Uh, when I go up to Taos, um, I use the bookstore there, again, to promote and um, provide um, ours, our clientele to the local businesses in state. Sometimes you're not able to, so sometimes people do buy things on Amazon, but if we can work towards sustaining and promoting local businesses, uh, that's what I would like for us to do. But this is our books. Our next book club will be in June the 14th, um, um, a couple of days after Father's Day, that in search of Chaco, a new approaches, uh, new approaches to the uh, archeological enigma of the Chaco culture, uh, the edited and uh, written by David Grant Noble. So again, right now there is no, they, we do not have the book at the Cultural Center, but Andrew is working to try and get that uh, scheduled for us. So. I hope that we'll see some of you back here again uh, back in June in a couple more weeks when we talk about this particular book. And so um, here are some of the website addresses for those of you who have, have, want to have access to those, the Indian Public Cultural Center dot, dot org. Uh, contact us is a way that you can drop us questions, inquiries. Perhaps if you did not uh, have access to the book club, but you would like to know about it, drop us an email through that if you want to know how to uh, perhaps view other previous book club uh, recorded sessions, connect us through that. We are on Facebook at the Indian Public Cultural Center Book Club, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, as well as uh, YouTube. We certainly have tried to make every effort to make sure that we can connect with other groups of people. So I want to thank you again, Lois. We, I'm, I was Hi, just guest and yeah. really appreciate it for you to join us. Let me, oh, hold on, let, let me make sure everybody to, so, so that they're waving to you, back to you. Uh, oops, wrong one. Here we go. There we go. Everybody wave to Lois. Bye, everybody. There we go. Thank you. And again, thank you, every one of us, who, every one of you who joined us uh, on um, Zoom. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to put a face to a voice a little bit later on. Uh, the Indian Public Cultural Center is now open for its uh, summer session. We have dance performances on Friday afternoons at 2 p.m., Saturday and Sunday at 11 as well. We have a number of events coming up. Uh, so look us up on our website address at indianpueblo.org. We have a number of events scheduled uh, for the remainder of the year. Obviously, Balloon Fiesta is the big event, big draw here. So we'll have a number of events and activities here. October, uh, we also have, um, I'm sorry, August is uh, the Pueblo Revolt. So we'll have a number of events scheduled for that event as well. Uh, if you look on our website, we have several events called the Intimate Indigenous uh, Experience. Uh, I'm not sure whether we're sold out on that uh, experience. That's a way that we can draw in from our previous efforts of um, membership, as well as the gala that was here providing support for our 501c3 nonprofit components. So we invite you to do that. Also important, one of the most important things that what allows this place to function is all the volunteers. So if anyone's interested in being a volunteer, contributing in any form or any way, we would certainly appreciate you connect with us through our volunteer organizations. 
that we will be glad to connect with you either through my email or some of the other emails, please visit us on the website. So there's a lot of ways that are you can participate as well. So um, as well as, let me bring this up here. This is the list of books for the remainder of the year. It looks like this. You should have access to this on the internet. Uh, those of you who were asked for it here, I will get you copies. So there's a front and a back page. It shows you all the books that we have read so far and for the remaining books that we will read for the remainder of the year. Um, we, I'm so for, we are so fortunate to have Lois join us today. I was really glad to that. I have put an invitation out in for December for our December book. Our December book will be The Night Watchman. Uh, the author is a um, Pulitzer Prize Award recipient, Louise Edrich. Hopefully she'll get to be able to join us. And some plans for next year, um, three years, two years ago, you know, three years ago, we had um, a, U a US Poet Laureate, uh, Joy Harjo as our guest. I'm going to invite her again next year because she had a book come out last year. So she, Poet, Poet Warrior will be the book I will be planning to be in April of 2023. So a lot of things going on. We hope that you'll be able to join us. And again, connect with us through our website, Facebook and other events and activities. We want to make sure that you are here to help us uh, participate with the book club. So we thank everybody to joining us today. Um, if anybody has any comments or questions, let me see one more last thing here. Um, when can we sign up for the book up? All one needs to do is go to our website at indianpueblo.org. And when you see, let me bring that up here on my screen here. Um, let me connect here. Okay. Indianpueblo.org. When you go to indianpueblo.org, you should see this page here. Scroll down and you'll see where it says calendar of events. So for today, it says, May the 10th, it will say on June the 14th, it will say Pueblo Book Club, and it will tell you how you can register. When you click on this option, you'll get you'll be able to register for the, if you want to join us via Zoom, or I usually send an email out, tells you all the information about when you can join us and when to sign up for the book club. So there's a lot of events going on. So um, I think I've covered everything. Um, let's see, make sure I've got everybody no more questions to answer over here. Again, thank you very much, Lois. We really do appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We look forward to join, having you all joining us again um, for our June book club. So I'm going to close out with my closing credits here because I am not just me, but all, all, a great deal of number of people contribute to our, the book club. Uh, I, I, I certainly am grateful for all the contributions, all the help of everybody that joins us. So thank you everybody for joining us today.